All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. As you can tell by the thumbnail, the title, and by his presence here today, we have the honor of having a digital town hall with Vivek Ramaswamy, who is running for president in 2024. Vivek, thank you so much for being here. My honor. How you doing? I'm great. And uh, just for everyone who's watching, we had a technical glitch on my end, nothing like some <laughs> adrenaline coursing through my veins before a, before a big event like this. But I'm so happy that we're finally starting. Um, so we're going to be taking some live questions from the chat. It's going to be a great time. But to get things going, I actually have something that I know I personally have been wondering. And that is kind of the why behind your campaign. So this is not going to be me trying to flatter you, but you're obviously an accomplished person. You're an entrepreneur. You're an author. You have a lot going for you. Why Why do you feel the need to run for president? And I think just as importantly, why now? Trump has the overwhelming support of the Republican Party. So why not wait until 2028 if you did want to run for president? So uh, why now? Yeah, so I don't think we have a long time to work with my wife asked me initially the question last December, are you sure we don't want to do this 20 years from now when our kids are out of the house? I don't think we have 20 years to work with. I think we're working within a very short window to lead our way out of a national identity crisis that we're in. And I think part of the reason why is I understand how to reach the next generation of Americans in a way that no other candidate in this field, I think, can with a vision of what it even means to be an American today wokeness, gender ideology, climatism, covidism. These are symptoms of a deeper hunger for purpose and meaning in our country. And too long, Lauren, as a conservative movement, I think we have been running from something. Now is our moment to start running to something, to our vision of what it means to be a citizen of this country. I'll tell you about Donald Trump. I believe that he was an excellent president by and large. Are there some things I would have done differently? Absolutely. But I think he was an excellent president. But it's just a fact that there is about 30% of this country that becomes truly psychiatrically ill when he is in the White House, when he occupies the role of the US presidency. And I think it is very important for us to be able to revive our shared national ideals as a nation in ways that go beyond traditional Republican or Democrat boundaries. And so, yes, I am an America first conservative, but I think I can take our agenda to the next level further than Trump ever did and unite the country while we're at it. That goes to the question of why now rather than 2028. It also goes to the question of what needs to be accomplished. We need to shut down our unconstitutional administrative state like the Department of Education. Not good enough to just put Betsy DeVos on top of it. We have to shut it down. I think we have to actually declare independence from China, actually use our military to secure the southern border, not just build the wall. And so in many ways, I'm going far further with our own America first agenda than Trump did. But I think we will unite more of the country around it as we do. And that's why I'm in this race. All right. Now we have questions that are starting to come in from our viewers. Here's one that I, I, I know I've been wondering myself, there have been some old tweets of yours that have been circling, uh, circling around specifically one that I think was released at the height of the pandemic. So it's over fat kid asks old tweets sound like you were for jab mandates. What is your position on mandatory vaccinations, new and old vaccines and for children? So I've been dead set against vaccine mandates, but you're right. Early on in the pandemic, just like pretty much everybody you're going to find in the Republican field right now, based on the data that was reported to the public, which we now know was based on a lie, based on that data, I did get two shots myself and believed that that was a good choice for people to make. I no longer believe that. I would, have, I would definitely have not done it myself had I known what we now know. Young, healthy men suffering from rates of myocarditis way higher than rates that could be explained by anything else other than COVID-19 vaccination on a mass scale. So I think that was a mistake. And as the facts changed, I changed my views as well. On the merits, I've never been in favor of vaccine mandates. I'm a libertarian at heart, mask mandates. I believe the government should not mandate citizens to do anything. I believe that often citizens, if they're going to be convinced of something, should be convinced based on the actual merits of an argument. So that's what I believed at the time. I wrongly thought in the merits of the argument that actually vaccination even made sense for young, healthy men like myself. I'm dead set against COVID-19 mandatory vaccination. And even the idea of young, healthy people even having the choice to take them, I think, should not choose to take them today. 
I, I can tell you're not a politician and let me explain how you actually answered that question. At first I was like, oh, is he going to skirt around and just talk about what he would do? But no, you actually uh, directly addressed the mandate. So I appreciate that. Uh, I think, I think the, that straight talk is something that the audience really appreciates. So Randy V asks Vivek, yep. you claim you would look to work out a deal to end the Russia Ukraine war and Trump wrote the book, the art of the deal. What would you do differently compared to Trump? Look, I've actually, uh, I'll give Trump a run for his money on my career. I started not with money. I started with no money, and I've built multi-billion dollar companies on the back of actually doing some of the most exceptional deals the biotech industry has seen. That's been written about in separate contexts, but this is a different level, right? This isn't just about replicating business lessons on the global stage. This is about understanding the essence of where the real threats are that the U.S. faces, so Trump has said he would end the Russia-Ukraine war in 24 hours with a deal, but hasn't said what that deal would be. I think this is a really important issue. It's important to be specific. The top threat that the U.S. faces is the Russia-China military alliance. Russia has nuclear weapons and hypersonic missile capabilities ahead of the U.S. China has naval capacity and, by the way, an economy that we depend on for our modern way of life. That's a separate problem we need to fix, our dependence on China, but that's the fact right now. What I've said is I would end the Ukraine war on terms that require Vladimir Putin to exit his military alliance with China. That's how we advance U.S. interests. Now, in any good deal, it's true that everybody has to get a win out of the deal. I'm honest about that. Putin should get a win. Here's the win he should get. He should get the win of freezing the current lines of control and a hard commitment that NATO will not and will never admit Ukraine to NATO. Those are big wins for Putin, but it's an even bigger win for the United States of America. The way we win is that now we've dismantled the Russia-China alliance. That is also, by the way, how we deter China from going after Taiwan while avoiding the risk of going to war over it. Why? Because China has to think twice now if Russia's no longer in their camp. But if Russia's in their camp, Xi Jinping's bet is the U.S. won't want to challenge two different allied nuclear superpowers at the same time. But if we pull Russia apart from China, Xi Jinping's de definitely going to have to think twice. And so that's at once both how we end the Ukraine war. I don't think it was the right decision to send $200 billion plus in equipment and direct aid to defend somebody else's border when we could be using that money to defend our own border here at home. But it is also how we accomplish a broader objective for the U.S. that deters China from going after Taiwan and avoids the risk of war and even riskier war for the United States that we otherwise might be dragged into. That gives you a sense of how I think about deal making when it comes to national security and foreign policy. And I think this is, issue is so important that I can't just play those cards close to the vest. I think it's really important to be transparent. I'm the only candidate in either party who has actually offered a clear plan of not only how to end the Ukraine war, but how to more broadly advance our interests. And that's how I would do it. All right. Now, this question kind of ties into certain aspects of, I guess, the national security. And I know as a mother, this is something that uh, I'm definitely interested to hear. Susie Quick asks, the recent release of Sound of Freedom has brought more attention to child trafficking. What policies do you advocate for that would help solve this problem? Definitely and I'm a father of two sons myself. And this is very personal to me because even my parents came from India. We, we used to go to India as kids. This is actually an underappreciated problem for a long time. I'm really grateful that this film put a spotlight on it. As U.S. president, my job is to look at this from an American perspective. I am an America first conservative. I stand on the side of doing the right thing, but first through the lens of looking at this problem in America, and it exists. One of the big problems is a porous border. Sealing the southern border is an important part of solving that problem. Part of this is also enforcing the laws that are already on the books. We have a broken FBI in so many ways, an FBI that will pursue its political enemies from Donald Trump on down, even calling concerned parents at school board meetings domestic terrorists, and yet completely abdicating its role in effectively enforcing the law against people who are kidnapping kids and selling them into child trafficking rings, both in the United States and around the world. An organization that's done better at this is the U.S. Marshals. So part of what I've said, and this is part of a broader vision for our federal police state, is 
I would shut down the FBI. But I go into detail on what that means. The 20,000 back office people who are the source of the political rot, yeah, they're going to be fired and they're going to have to find honest work. But that's only 20 of the 35,000 employees. The remaining 15,000 should be reorganized to other parts of the federal police apparatus that actually are doing a better job from the DEA to the U.S. Marshals to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network under the, underneath the U.S. Treasury. And the U.S. Marshals has been outstanding in busting up a lot of child sex trafficking rings. And so I think that both the combination of increasing penalties and improving enforcement of existing laws with an actual spine, with authority to send the signals that we do not stand for that here in the United States, combined with sealing the southern border and even the border in even the northern border, increasingly a risk in this country, that addresses this at least from an American perspective. And I hope that provides a shining example of how other countries, including in Europe, where this is a major problem, can take inspiration from how we address that problem here at home. That just scratches the surface. I know we want to get to other questions, Lauren, but at least gives you a sense of how I think. It's an important problem. I'm grateful to the people who made that movie for finally putting a spotlight on it. Right. I think it's very important and to see the, I guess, criticism it's been met with being called right-wing propaganda or QAnon adjacent, I know for me has been frustrating. But this is something you're probably hearing a lot as you're campaigning. Uh, this is from Jesse Bear 2115 As a fervent Trump supporter, I am torn. Your policy is everything I could ask for, but I know Trump has the motivation to do what needs to be done. Please convince me you're the better pick. And I suppose just generally, uh, there are a lot of Trump supporters out there yeah. who like what you have to say but they may see you as an unknown compared to Trump, who at the very least has a proven track record in office. I understand that. And I want to start by admitting openly that I think President Trump was an excellent president, actually. And he's a friend. We have a good mutual relationship of respect. Here's why I'm in this race, though. I, I alluded to it before. I'll put a fine point on it. I think that there is a mental health epidemic that he it's not even his fault, but when he's in office, just exists in this country. People who disagree with things they otherwise would have agreed with because they're coming out of his mouth. Is that his fault? No, it's not. Is it a fact? Absolutely. Did we learn that over his four years in office and even the time since then we did? I'm not having that same effect on people. I can't tell you why, but it's just a fact that I'm not. I'm reaching young people. 40% of the donors to our campaign right now, I've got 70,000 small dollar donors. 40% of those people are first time ever donors to a Republican. Many of them, most of them are young. We're doing this for the next generation, for my two sons and their generation. I want to be a president and I expect you to hold me to the standard of being this president where we can look our kids in the eye and tell them in good conscience, I want you to grow up and be like him. I understand how to reach and inspire young people across this country. That will allow me to take the America first agenda even further than Donald Trump did. I'm not just shutting. I'm not just putting Betsy DeVos on top of the Department of Education. I'm in this to shut it down and have offered unprecedented clarity on exactly how we would do it, including the legal basis. I'm not just building the southern border wall and, yes, finish the construction of that wall. They're building tunnels under that wall, the right solution. And I was the first candidate to say it and I stand by my legal authority to do it, that we will use the military to seal that border and secure our own southern border and our northern border too. When you take an issue like affirmative action, I pressed Trump's people on this. Lyndon Johnson created affirmative action amongst government contractors. That's 20% of the US workforce today subjected to these race-based quota systems from the federal government. Trump could have taken a pen and crossed it out with a line. I understand why he didn't. They said it was a political hill they didn't want to die on. I'm not afraid of that political hill because when you're driving 30% of this country psychiatrically ill to psychiatric illness, you have to weigh which battles you fight. I'm not weighing which battles we fight. We're actually just reviving the ideals of the American revolution itself. And so there are other candidates in this race who at best are going to give you reform. And if you want incremental reform, then I'm not your candidate. But if you want revolution, I'm the candidate who's actually bringing that to the table in ways that go far beyond Republican and Democrat boundaries. 1776 is the ideal that I use as my North Star. OK, I'm not even a, a Trump America first conservative. I am a George Washington America first conservative. He was the OG. 
Okay, and so America first, it doesn't belong to Trump. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you, to us, to the people of this country. And we have to ask the question, who's going to take that agenda even further? And in many ways, it takes an outsider to do it. Trump was that outsider in 2015. Look, in many ways, I think I'm not going to be the same person eight years from now that I am today. Just like Trump isn't exactly the same person today that he was eight years ago either. I think in many ways, I'm closer to Trump in 2015 than Trump today is to Trump in 2015 because we're human. We're all human. And I respect his accomplishments immensely. I'm going to build on that foundation, take us forward. Eight years from now, I'm going to pass the mic on to the next guy. That's how we actually drive change on the scale of history for our country. And I'm in this race because I can both go further with our agenda, but also unite much of this country in the process. And I think I'm best positioned to actually do that, especially in bringing young Americans along with us. So I hope that answered your question. I think it definitely did for a lot of people. Um, and I, I, I know you have a short, short time, yeah. so perhaps we can just get one more in. Sure. Quick answer. Ranting monkey, one of Trump's biggest issues was relying on establishment politicians to recommend cabinet heads, yes. leading to a lot of bad picks. How would you put together a cabinet as an outsider? So we're already doing it. Actually, one of the most important things we're developing in-house, actually, this is the first time I'm mentioning this publicly, Lauren, but I'll, I'll just share it, is I've said that we want to get rid of 75% of the employees in the federal employee base. That means we keep one out of every four. The most important thing we need at scale, we're talking about tens of thousands, really hundreds of thousands of employees, is a way of screening who actually fits the criteria of being part of the one out of four that we actually want to keep. So we're working on detailed, I mean, understanding of competence, psychological profiling, their answers to questions of understanding of the Constitution, what they are or are not empowered to do, what many people in the administrative state actually misunderstand, wielding power, sort of hiding behind the veil, but effectively getting their job satisfaction, not from their paycheck, but from the amount of power they actually wield, their understanding of constitutional restraint to filter out the 75% we need to fire. That never happened under Trump. The other thing is, he, look, he took advice from people who did not have his or our country's best interests at heart. And that's why I think it takes not just an outsider CEO, and I'm an outsider CEO too. I've built businesses that have employed thousands of people in this country, that have helped thousands of people in this country. It's going to take an outsider CEO who also has a first personal understanding of the law and the Constitution. I actually understand Article 2 of the Constitution. I actually understand the 1977 Presidential Reorganization Act, which says you can shut down redundant government agencies without asking Congress for permission. Trump's advisors told him that the civil service protections stopped him from firing federal employees. What they didn't tell him is read the law. It turns out that doesn't apply to mass layoffs. It only applies to individual firings, which aren't supposed to be politically motivated. But mass layoffs are exempt and mass layoffs are absolutely what I am bringing to the D.C. bureaucracy. So that's the combination is. I'm in many cases not going to listen from the advisory class that's grown from the same, the same swamp that we are in this to drain. So I think it takes a leader with first personal constitutional conviction who will bring in outsiders who are bulldogs. One of his mistakes was in positions like the Office of Personnel Management. It's like the head of HR in the federal government or the Office of Management and Budget, which is like the equivalent of the CFO of the federal government. He put in place people who ended up being mediators between him and the administrative state. What I want is a bulldog in that position who's fundamentally anti-government, shares that anti-government conviction, comes from outside the government, but is going to see my vision through for how the executive branch of the government runs. And again, that's not blaming Trump. Maybe if I were the first person trying to do this, as he was back in 2016, maybe I would have made the same mistakes. But the reality is I'm going to learn from his mistakes to build on that foundation to actually do it right or at least take that agenda to the next level with strong legal footing. And yes, with a not only willingness, but a readiness, not just to break glass, but to bring a jackhammer to it. That's what it's going to take. 75% layoff, shutting down government agencies that don't exist, not just putting Betsy DeVos on top of the Department of Education, but shuttering it. That's the kind of mentality we're going to need, creative destruction. And as I said, if you want incremental reform, pick any one of the other 
super PAC puppets in the race. But if you actually want revolution, the values of the American revolution, restoring three co-equal branches of government in a country that's not dependent on its enemy for our modern way of life, that's why I'm in this race. And I think I've got fresh legs. I'm 37. <laughs> I'm not yet jaded and cynical The you know, Biden and even Trump, they're over twice my age. I've got fresh legs. I've got the energy to do this. Eight years from now, maybe I'll be tired and ready to move on, but that's not me today. And that's why I'm in the race. All right. I think I got chills when you said mass layoffs. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're bringing. I mean, a lot of other people, I'm sure. Uh, so for people who want to know more about your campaign or donate to you, where can they find you? Uh, let, let people know how sure. they can get involved. Vivek2024.com. V-I-V-E-K 2024.com. If you want to give a dollar, give a dollar. If you want to give 6,600, give 6,600. I've put in over 15 million of my own money. We're not dependent on the mega donor class. I refuse to play that game, but we are dependent on not just financially, but volunteers lifting this campaign up. And so whether it's spreading yard signs, spreading hats, spreading the message or giving a dollar, whatever it is, join them. You know, it's really going to be the revival of the American revolution. If you want to join that movement, yeah, just go up, sign up and whatever way you can help. I appreciate it. All right. And thank you, Vivek, thank you. for taking our questions, spending some time with us. And everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Thank you.